الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد All praises due to Allah And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to exalt the mention and grant peace to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to his companions and all those who follow them on the righteous path until the day of judgment. As they say, better late than never. Alhamdulillah. Allah musta'an. When one looks at the condition of the ummah today, one can only wonder what has brought us here. You know, the condition we're in is not very, uh, let's say, satisfactory. And if you investigate, even for a short, short time, upon just inv investigating, you will find that the primary reason behind the, the, behind the condition of the ummah today is uh, the people abandoning the sunnah, the abandonment of the sunnah and the spreading of innovations. That's what it boils down to. Abandonment of the sunnah and spreading of innovations. Now it's, it's shameful enough, it is shameful enough for a Muslim to abandon the sunnah. That's not befitting. But to actually also invent into the religion, whether it is active worship or new belief systems, or uh, forms of remembrance of Allah, or a special way of praying, or anything along these lines. Uh, sometimes an, a new religion comes into existence altogether. A new religion is actually a calamity. And among those who have probably done all that which I have mentioned earlier, are the Sufis. And you may be wondering why. Well, insha'Allah, you will hear and see in this lecture why. Why are the Sufis among those who have actually brought a relation between all that which I mentioned to you earlier? Depending on the kind of Sufis we have. I would like to begin by saying to every Sufi out there, who will hear this lecture in the future, I ask you for Allah's sake to listen attentively to the evidences and the facts which I will present. Then question yourself, are you being true to the teachings of Islam? Are you being true to the teachings of Islam? This goes out to people like Muhammad Yaqubi, this goes out to people like Hamza Yusuf. This, this goes out to people like Noor Hamim Keller. This goes out to people like Sheikh Nazim, Zaid Shakir, Naeem Abdul Wali, Ibrahim Musa, Noor Din Durki, TJ Winters, Hisham Kabbani or Qabbani, Muhammad Nainawi and many others which I could not enumerate, otherwise the whole lecture will be mentioning names. But this goes out to them. Because these are the individuals today who carry the banner of Sufism. Some are more extreme than others, and some are more moderate than others, but they all share the common platform of Sufism. You may be saying, and what's the big deal? Sufism has always been around. It's something wonderful, dealing with sp spirituality and asceticism and all these good, you know, uh, good qualities of Islam. What's the problem with Sufism? Well, I'll tell you, if it, if it was only that, there'd be no problem. But it doesn't stop there. It does not stop there, rather it continues. Uh, I say to them further, those individuals and others, any Sufi, any Sufi, do not let pride or arrogance prevent you from adhering to the truth. And remember that the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith in Sahih Muslim, لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال ذرة من كبر. He shall not enter paradise. The one who has the weight of a grain of arrogance in his heart. A grain. 
of arrogance, the weight of that is nothing. That's it, almost nothing. It's like air. He will not enter Jannah if he has this much arrogance. Now, when the Prophet ﷺ said that to one of the Sahaba, you know, he said this to the Sahaba, one of them said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, one of us likes to, you know, put on some nice clothing, have a, have a nice pair of shoes. He said, Inna Allah jameelun yuhibbul jamal. No, no, Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. Then he told them, Al Kibr, Ghamtu al Haq, Batru al Haq, wa Ghamtu al Nas. Al Kibr, Batru al Haq, Afwan, wa Ghamtu al Nas. It is rejecting the truth and belittling people. What is arrogance? When the truth is presented and something in your heart does not allow you to submit, you find it within yourself that, you know, I'm in front of all these people, I will, you know, I'll be undermined, I'll be belittled, I'll be this and that. So person, a person start worrying about his reputation, his reputation among the people, so they will not go back to the truth even though they have recognized it. A quality that is very common among the non-Muslims. They know Islam is the truth, but at, at some point in time, they have such a, you know, a position among their community that they say to themselves, but if I become Muslim, all these people will say, what happened to me? I was, you know, I wasn't true to our religion and they will remain upon falsehood even though they know it. That is not a quality of a Muslim. So don't let pride prevent you from adhering to the truth. And remember that you'll be responsible before Allah on the day of judgment for all the Muslims that you have misguided. And on the day of judgment, those Sufi master leaders, the Sufi masters and their followers shall curse each other. As Allah said in the Quran, وَإِذْ تَبَرَّأَ الَّذِينَ اتُّبِعُوا مِنَ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوا وَرَأَوُا الْعَذَابَ وَتَقَطَّعَتْ بِهِمُ الْأَسْبَابِ When those who were followed, they will, they will uh, disown and declare their innocence from their followers. And they will see the torment and then all relations will be cut off. The good stuff that was on today shall be put to an end on the day of judgment. يَوْمَ لَا تَمْلِكُ نَفْسٌ لِنَفْسٍ شَيْئًا On the day where no soul has anything to give or present to another soul. Then Allah continued in the next ayah, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوا لَوْ أَنَّ لَنَا كَرَّةً فَنَتَبَرَّأَ مِنْهُمْ كَمَا تَبَرَّأُوا مِنَّا كَذَلِكَ يُرِيهِمُ اللَّهُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ حَسَرَاتٍ عَلَيْهِمْ then those who were the followers will say, if only we are given a chance to return, then we will disown them the same way they have disowned us. Allah said, and such Allah shall make their deeds as means of regret for them. On the day of judgment, it will not be of any benefit. مع الرسول سبيلا يا ويلة ليتني لم أتخذ فلانا خليلا لقد أضلني عن الذكر بعد إذ جاءني وكان الشيطان للإنسان خذولا. On the day where the oppressor, the one who went against the Sunnah, will bite on his hand of regret and he will say, I wish I had taken with the messenger a path. I wish I was upon the Sunnah, didn't go left or right. Then he will continue to mention those who were the reason behind his misguidance. Uh, oh, I wish, woe to me, had I not taken such and such person as an intimate friend. And Allah said, then he will say, he has misled me from the dhikr, from the remembrance, from the truth after it came to me, and ever is the shaitan a deserter at the time of need. When you need the shaitan, he will say, مَا أَنَا بُمُسْرِخُكُمْ وَمَا أَنْتُمْ بِمُسْرِخِي I cannot help you, you cannot help me. لُومُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Blame yourselves, don't blame me. So any Sufi or anyone who's not upon the Sunnah, let us not wait till this time when it will be too late and it will be nothing but regret. The Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is clear like the sun. Allah made no ambiguity, no mysteries in Islam. The only religion which has no mysteries in it whatsoever is Islam. It is clear, it is obvious. The only time someone will go astray is if they turn away from the clarity and they seek some mis mysterious methods and understandings. Pretty much philosophical, which is what the Sufis are really based on. Now, uh, the matter is so serious, my brothers in Islam, that while I was preparing for this lecture, I had to go through the Sufi websites. 
right? Because I need to know, you know, what these people are really about. I can't just be coming, you know, running my mouth without any solid evidences. And when I went to the sites, you know, reading their statements, observing their reputations, it struck me that uh, we are different in almost everything. There's a difference in almost everything. The Sufis have no reservation using the term Sufi. Now you may find some people, for example, who have a particular you know, sect in Islam. If you try to call them by that name, they will be, they will be you know, offended. The Sufis don't have, have no problem with using the name Sufism and calling himself a Sufi. Keeping in mind that there's nothing in the Quran or the Sunnah ever alluding to this title. So the name itself is innovated. What do you think about the rest of the teachings? If the name itself comes from, you know, they differed about where it came from. Some of them say Ahl al-Sufa. Linguistically, it cannot be. Some of them said from the Sophia, Greek word, which means wisdom. Historically, that cannot be. And they have a number of interpretations. The most sound one, that Sufiya, our tasawwuf, our Sufiyun, our Sufi, comes from Suf. Suf is wool. It's the fabric. Wool. Why? Around a hundred years after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, remember innovations, innovations started to occur at the time of the Sahaba. And you all know the famous hadith of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. Where one of the tabi'een told him, I saw something odd in the masjid, but I didn't say anything until you judge. And he waited for Ibn Mas'ud in front of his house. Then Ibn Mas'ud came out, they went to the masjid, they found some people sitting in a circle, remembering Allah in what fashion? By throwing rocks. He will say, say takbir, and they will count Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar using stones or pebbles. And Ibn Mas'ud said, what are you doing? What are you doing? They said, we're remembering Allah. He said, count your evil deeds. I guarantee you, your good deeds will not be erased. Woe to you of Ummah Muhab of, um, oh, umma of Muhammad وسلم, how soon you will be destroyed. The silk, the clothing of the Prophet وسلم, is still around us. It's still around. And verily, either you are better guided than the Messenger of Allah, or you are opening up a door of misguidance. From back then, people started to go to extremes. Among them are those people. They said we will only wear wool to resemble, to resemble who? Jesus, the son of Mary. To resemble Isa ibn Maryam. This, while knowing that the Prophet وسلم, used to wear cotton and all kinds of fabric. And he specifically hated wool. In the hadith in Abu Dawood in Al-Hakim, which is Sahih by Dhahabi and others, uh, Aisha anha said, I made for the Messenger of Allah a shirt of wool. When he put it on and he sweat in it, he, was, he disliked the smell of the sweat. The, the order that came from the from the t-shirt because of sweat so he threw it away in fact he didn't like it because when he sweat alayhi salatu salam the order which it, it uh, uh, you know produced wasn't very pleasant so he didn't even like to wear wool so this is where it began that we don't like the dunya we're detached from the dunya it began it began as asceticism which is fine zuhd we have a word for that in islam called Zuhd, being careless about the dunya. You don't care about this worldly life. You're looking forward to the life to come. It's a wonderful concept. Islam is based on that to a large extent. But see, it began with that. And as the Prophet ﷺ said, and woe to you from introducing anything into Islam because every newly introduced matter is an innovation. Every innovation will lead astray and that will lead to the fire. Uh, innovations begin small, then they grow and grow until they destroy the person engaged in them. And this is exactly what happened to the Sufis. Now, uh, if you visit the sites, you see some crazy stuff, okay? I thought I was visiting a Hindu website or possibly a Buddhist. Picture of their shuyukh with their big green turbans. And you know, one of them, it says, Sufi master, Sufi master, Sheikh Qabbani blesses the people of Indonesia. A Muslim blesses the people? You give barakah to the people? Where does the barakah come from? 
Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah is the one who gives barakah. People give barakah? People, regular people? The Sufi master, Hisham Qabbani, this is a big Sufi master in, in the United States. He blesses the Indonesian people. Blesses them. Is this Islamic? This is not Islamic. But this is what you will find on the site. So what are the differences? Well, let me tell you the differences so we'll be upon clarity. Where do we differ? I'm going to present to you a list of commonly practiced Sufi teachings and give you the counter evidences in Islam to show you that these practices are not from the Sunnah, not from the Quran, not from Islam. And everyone will make a judgment of his own, his or her own. First, you must know what is known as the Sufi order or in Arabic, tariqa, branches, tariqa. Listen to these names, Naqshibandiya, Qadiriya, Jistaniya, Shadiliya, Rifa'iya, Rahmaniya, Subhaniya, Tijaniya, Sanusiya, and the list goes on of Iyya, 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 usually they say, oh, but not in this case. You know, every time a guy comes up with something, okay guys, check it out now. I think I just received kashf, okay? I just had some divine, divine inspiration from Allah. You should say subhanallah 732 times, alhamdulillah 254 times. He comes up with a formula and this becomes a new tariqah to worship Allah. They name it after the Sufi master and people celebrate it for years and years and generations to come. That's what it boils down to. Some guy's own fabricated way of worshiping Allah. And this is, you know, what Sufism is? Turuq. Ways and orders. The Sufi orders. The Sufi masters. But Allah said, وَلَا تَكُونُوا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيَعًا كُلُّ حِزْبٍ بِمَا لَدَيْهِمْ فَرِحُونَ Don't be like, don't be among the polytheists. Don't be like the mushrikun. What was their quality? They split up their religion into various sects and each one happy and content with the way they have. And basically, they're basically dividing. And you know what's amazing? Each one, each Sufi master of a tariqah, he claims that his tariqah is the only correct way and the other ones are no good. His tariqah is the way to Allah. Dividing the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when we have been warned in the Quran and the Sunnah against the division of the Ummah. It's not a joke. It's not a joke. Sufis, first of all, before we go into some of their common belief systems and practices, they are primarily divided into three categories, depending on the level of deviance. Depending on the level of deviance. The school of thought among the Sufis, the schools of thought, the first one is known as the Illuminist school of philosophy. Illuminist because they say that, you know, uh, the soul illuminates with light. These people don't focus as much, as much on asceticism as much as they are in, involved with philosophy. Their whole thing is about philosophy. And basically they say that you must uh, exercise your soul. You must actually go through spiritual exercises, training the soul and punishing the body in order to attain purity of the soul. So one of them, if he found that he was becoming too arrogant, he will go to the public hammam, public showers, which existed back then, and he would steal someone's towel on purpose. Then he would run out, allow the people to catch him and beat him up. And he's saying that by doing so, I am actually humbling myself. In case he thought that he was a little too special, then he puts himself in a predicament where he is humiliated and punished in order to kind of subdue himself and remember that he is nothing but a worthless creature. Is this something the Prophet ﷺ would approve? Is this something that we are allowed to do? Put ourselves in this predicament? No. But this is the Illuminist uh, Sufis and this is their school of philosophy. These are actually, these are actually the, the most moderate among them. Uh, these are okay. You know, if you can, not okay as in okay, okay compared to the rest. The rest is, is crazy. Listen to this. The second ideology is that of Hulul. Hulul means that Allah dwells in His creation. Does that remind you of a religion? Who does it remind you of? Christians and Hindus. Allah dwells and is incarnate in human beings. 
The person who propagated this was known as Al-Hallaj. Uh, the Abbasis, you know, the Abbasite uh, government back then, decided that he was a heretic and they crucified him in the year 309. Because this was an utter statement of disbelief. He used to say, look, look what he used to say. He said, glory to him who manifested his human nature. Glory to him, a'udhu billah. Who manifested his human nature, hiding the piercing brightness of his divinity, till his creation saw him openly in the form of one eating and drinking. So basically, what you look at when you look at a man, you're looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to him. According to him. He said about him and Allah, we are two spirits who dwell in a single body. And some of them would use this, it would say at the time of the spiritual ecstasy, known as Satahat. When they go off a little off track, he will say, Subhani. Not Subhanallah. Subhani. Ma a'zam ashani. How great is my status and affair. Another one of them would say, There's nothing in this tawb but Allah. There's, and they say that this is when, this is at the, at the time of spiritual ecstasy. Yani they are in such contact with Allah that they do these things, you know, uh, unconsciously. And they're not supposed to be held accountable for them. Crazy stuff. Al-Hallaj said that Fir'aun was a believer. Fir'aun was a what? A what? A believer. And he condemned some who said that he's not. He refuted Harun, the brother of Musa, for criticizing the other people for worshiping the calf, the Bani Israel. You know, stuff that you think, you know, no one would ever say it is being said. The third ideology is that of Wuhdatul Wujud. And Wuhdatul Wujud is even worse than the, pre the previous one. The previous one is that Allah will manifest in some of His creation. He's incarnate in some human beings. This one says, everything you see is one existence and that existence is Allah. And if you affirmed any other existence, you're a mushrik. The concept of Tawheed that all of us now, everything in this universe is all of this is Allah. And if you claim that there was something else, then you become a mushrik. They went to say, the, the, uh, this guy uh, Ibn Arabi, another one of the most famous Sufis, he said the slave is the Lord and the Lord is the slave. The slave is the Lord and the Lord is the slave. He said those who worship the calf worship nothing except Allah. The Bani Israel. And, they, and now the Sufis say, but now listen, you meet any Sufi, and you tell him Ibn Arabi, and you know, as if you're mentioning to him the Prophet ﷺ. This is a man who's honored and venerated by Sufis unanimously. They say about him, he is Al-Arifu Billah, the one who truly knows Allah. They call him Al-Qutub Al-Akbar, the great pillar, you know, the great sphere. He is known Al-Misk al the sweetest smelling musk, the sweetest smelling musk. He's known as al kibrit Al-Ahmar, the reddest brimstone. Despite of his statements, these calamitous statements about Allah being everything and everything being Allah, and, and, and just it is, it is only fair to mention, now I know this is sensitive, and some may not like it, but this is an amana which I have to convey from my personal experiences. Many of the things that I mention, unfortunately are prevalent among Jama'atul Tabliq. Jama'atul Tabliq. Now, they do a lot of da'wah. May Allah reward them with goodness and pardon them for the shortcomings. At the end of the day, they are Muslim brothers who we wish goodness for. This is, this is the position which we hold. But at the same time, at the same time, some of these belief systems are found in Fada'il uh, A'mal uh, and Fada'il Sadaqat and Tabliq uh, Nisab and so on and so forth. I have read them with my own eyes. I have encountered people who believe that. And we had a confrontation about the idea that Allah is everywhere. And I was almost beat up in a masjid, in a house of Allah, a masjid. I was called all kinds of names, degraded as if I was not praying with them in the line a few moments ago. Now I'm not saying everyone is like that, but I'm saying that whoever joins Jama'at al-Tabliq has been involved in them, be careful, 
because among them or many of them have these Sufi tendencies and you may be contaminated or affected with this sooner or later. This is why the ulama say it is not allowed to go on khuruj with them. And Allah is my witness. I have heard all kinds of lies, fabricated narrations, innovated practices that have nothing to do with the sunnah. Many of them are shirki based among our brothers. It's a very sensitive subject matter. So yes, they're doing a lot of da'wah, but we have been taught in the Quran, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرًا أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي وَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Say, O oh Muhammad وسلم, this is my path. I call to Allah upon knowledge, I and those who follow me. And glory be to Allah. Perfect is Allah above any imperfection. I am not among those who ascribe harness to Allah. You have to give da'wah upon knowledge or you don't give da'wah. Not everyone can give a bayan and not everyone can address the people specifically when we don't have the foundation to do so. And this is what happens. One person hears from another a fabricated narration, then he gives it in the bayan the next day. We are lying against the Prophet ﷺ. We are teaching people things that are not from the sunnah. So I, I ask all the brothers who are involved in jama'at tabligh, Continue your da'wah, may Allah reward you with goodness. Continue calling people to salah, it's important. But prioritize and put tawheed first. And for you to teach tawheed, you need to learn tawheed. Learn tawheed, teach tawheed, invite people to the salah, and stick to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because Muhammad Idris al-Diobandi uh, is the, the founder of Jama'at al-Tabligh, he was a hardcore Sufi who used to wait at the grave sites and, and, and wait for inspiration from the dead people. And this is information that has been documented and is found in books. It is not from my own statement. So the matter is sensitive. I'm only mentioning this because it's an amana. We have to convey the truth. We're not trying to bash anyone or try to undermine anyone. Some of them may be better in the sight of Allah than most of us because they are sincere and they may be ignorant. But at the end of the day, the sunnah is the sunnah. And we love the sunnah and the sunnah is more beloved to us than anyone in the world. Anyone in the world. If he's going to go against the sunnah, we say to him, Ma'as salama. Ma'as salama. We are, the, our example is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tayyip. Now let us deal with some of the common things among the Sufis. The Sufis call on other than Allah. What they call? Awliya. They call them awliya. And the concept of wilaya is sound and, can, and confirmed in the Quran and the Sunnah. Ala inna awliya Allahi la khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. Alladheena amanu wa kanu yattaqun. Nay, verily the awliya of Allah, they friends, the close friends of Allah. They shall be no grief over them, nor shall they be saddened. And Allah gave them their, their description. Those who used to believe and have taqwa. Those who believe and have taqwa. Not anyone who they build the shrine over his grave, he becomes the wali of Allah and we go visit him and expect help from him. So you find him saying, Ya Jilani, Ya Rifai, O Messenger of Allah, help and save. Audhu Billah. Calling on them other than Allah Azza wa Jal. And Allah had told us in the Quran, Ud'uni, astajib lakum, astajib lakum, call on me, I will respond to you. Amma yujibul muttarra idha da'ah. Who is the one who will respond to the caller when he is in the time of distress? When you call on him, it's only Allah. It's only Allah. Every place of prostration belongs to Allah. That's the whole earth. So do not call on anyone with Allah. If someone says, I'm not really calling on them. I am, I am seeking their intercession with Allah. I'm only trying to get a link between I and Allah. We say, the Prophet ﷺ said, al-ibadah. Once you call on someone, this is worshipping them, period. Once you say, Ya Rifai, you, before you say, help me, or tell Allah to help me, once you said, Ya Rifai, you have fell into shirk, because that's a form of calling on someone, and that is ibadah. You can't do that. The dead people cannot help. And we will see some more evidences of that. And Allah said, وَلَا تَدْعُ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَنْفَعُكَ وَلَا يَضُرُّكَ فَإِنْ فَعِلْتَ فَإِنَّكَ إِذَا مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ Don't call on besides anyone, anyone besides Allah. One who can neither benefit you nor harm you. If you do so, then verily you are among the wrongdoers. Al-Zulm here is a shirk. إِنَّ الظُّلْمَ لَشْ إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ 
Shirk is great oppression. Calling on anyone other than Allah will take you outside of Islam altogether. Allah says, If Allah afflicts you with harm, none can remove it but He. If something befalls you, only Allah can remove it. Not the Prophet وسلم, and anyone who is lesser than him. So you don't go to Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi in Al-Madina Al-Nabawiyya and you try to seek help from the Prophet وسلم, as many people do today. They turn away from the Qibla and they turn towards the grave. Some of them throw pieces of papers with some notes in them asking the Messenger of Allah وسلم, for help. And we all know and inshallah, this lecture will actually have part two. Part two will be actually dealing with that. The title of the next lecture is The Horn of Satan. Inshallah ta'ala. And we will deal with why, why, what are the fundamental teachings concerning tawassul and these issues. So no one will be doubtful about this issue. We will know, but we will postpone that till then, inshallah ta'ala. The Sufis advocate extreme asceticism in life. So some of them say, you know, if you go and try to look for a job, you don't really have tawakkul on Allah. You're supposed to just wait around. True tawakkul means that you will be sustained without having to make any effort. But the Prophet wasallam said, had you done tawakkul on Allah the way he deserves it, then he would sustain you like the birds. It goes out in the morning with an empty stomach, it comes, it comes back with a full one. What did he say? Did the bird stay at the nest and wait for rizq? No, it goes out seeking rizq, it comes back with it. So they say, you know, you don't have to do anything. You depend on Allah. So some of them don't engage and they don't see that it is acceptable to engage in, in jihad, striving for the cause of Allah in any way, shape or form. They say that, you know, this is not to be done. And Allah Azawajalla says, وَأَعِدُّ لَهُمْ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةً And prepare against them whatever you can of power and strength. Allah commanded us to make the necessary preparation. They say that, you know, no, no need for that. You know, we don't like the dunya. And try to, you know, get weaponry and try to, to, try to train, you know, when Muslims are engaged with jihad. Not to go blow up people and kill them innocently. That's, that's not Islam. Needless to say, anyone here in this should understand. We don't have such a thing where you go to a supermarket and blow, say, Allah Akbar, and you blow some up. So, mashallah, the next shaheed. No, 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 no. No, killing innocent people is not part of Islam. If people get on the battlefield, that's a whole other discussion. But like that, airplanes, buildings, trains, these are regular people going, you know, going about their business. What, what guilt do they have? Where's the da'wah? Where's the da'wah? Did we give them da'wah before they killed them? And even if you gave them da'wah and they didn't accept, are you allowed to kill an innocent civilian? No. So you know, these are the other extremes. You have one extreme, Sufis say don't do anything, and the other extreme say kill everyone alive. And we are in between. Neither we go with these nor we go with that. The Sufis refer the idea of Ihsan. You know Ihsan? You know when the Prophet وسلم, when Jibreel asked him, أَخْبِرْنِي عَلِي الْإِحْسَانِ قَالَ أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ فَإِن لَمْ, ت... فإن لم تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يراك. He said Ihsan is that you worship Allah as if you can see Him. But if you can't reach that level, then know that Allah sees you. But that's not how they define Ihsan. Ihsan is that when you are remembering Allah, or you are praying, you bring the image of the Shaykh to your mind. The Sufi Shaykh. And if you see some of the videos of this guy, Shaykh Nazim, on YouTube, in his own house, on, you know, on the highest places, they have pictures of their Sufi Shuyukh. The people they learned the Tariqah from. The Naqshbandi, the one they learned it from, they have a, you know, a chain. And when they pray to Allah, they bring to mind the image of a Shaykh. Astaghfirullah. Allah, this is amazing. When you read this, you say, where, where how? how? How can someone go? How can someone get so far away from the Sunnah? Into these extremes? You know, Allah al -musta'an. The Sufis allow dancing, drums, musical instruments, and raising the voice when making dhikr. You don't believe me. I mean, I don't really want to tell you to go see, but wallahi, I've seen with my eyes. Some of them live, some of them on YouTube. Check him, don't check him out. Trust me for it. Trust me for it. In Morocco, they know for the dancing. He put on a dress and they dance around. Others, you know, Allah, Allah, Allah. And they go shake, they, you know, they rock their hands, heads back and forth and up and down. Some of them bring some, you know, rod and he will shove it in his head. 
you know, the stuff that is unimaginable. All this in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In one, in one Egyptian Sufi gathering, men and women were dancing on the you know, stage together. Just, you know, swaying left and right. The lady from a TV station, you know, speaking to their big sheikh said, you know, some people may say, you know, what you're doing is not really from Islam. He said, you know, people are here, people are here with their souls, not their bodies. You know, just some philosophy. He gave her some answer that you would never accept. You know, justifying what the people, well, you know, these people, they, you know, we're in such a stage right now in loving Allah that men and women dance together, the women sing on stage, no problem. No problem. These are the gatherings, the Sufi gatherings. And other ones, I've seen them in the masjid, they have, uh, I believe from the tablighi, may Allah, tablighi jama'at, may Allah guide them, they have like seven of their shuyukh sitting in the front in the masjid, near the, the, the qibla, the mihrab. And then, you know, they will sit like this with their things and the men will come around to them, you know, like he'll be in a state of, of drunkenness, as if he's drunk. And then he will come to him, he will grab him by his head and I don't know what he will do, then the man will suddenly jump and start dancing and love, you know, this stuff that is crazy. People with beards, people that if you saw them, you know, down the street, you say, MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, that's the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, alive. Stuff that you would never imagine. Well, I'm sitting there like this on the TV. Are these people serious? What is he doing to these men? What did they come get? What kind of, you know, power? He shares his power, his energy, his hidayah with him. Allahu Alam. I don't even know what they really mean by these actions. But these are all commonly spread among the hardcore Sufis. Uh, but Allah said, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهِ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ but the true believers are those when Allah's name is remembered, their hearts tremble and fear is struck in their heart. Not the ones that when they remember Allah, they start dancing and they start singing. The ones that when they remember Allah, their hearts tremble without, without any option. This is how Allah Azza wa Jal made it. These are the true believers. Only the true believers are those. These people, they dance in the name of Allah Azza wa Jal. They sing in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will see what else they do in the name of Allah Jalla Jalalu. Another one of their bid'ah is the repetition, the repetition of Lafdul Jalala, Allah, Allah, who, who, who. You know the ayah? Allahu la, uh, Allahu la ilaha illa who. Right? The Surah Al Hashr, it comes twice in a row. Right? Who Allahu la ilaha illa who. Al Maliku al Quddus ila khiri. So they catch the word what? Who? Which is the pronoun he. And they substitute that for the name of Allah. So they say who, 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 and Allah, Allah, Allah. Which really, if you think about it logically, it's, does, it doesn't make sense. If, if your name was Ahmed, and I say Ahmed, 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 Ahmed. Soon enough, Ahmed will take off his shoe and he will smack me with it. <laughs> and if he did, I wouldn't be upset with him. What do you want, man? You know, naturally, what do you want? Yes, I'm Ahmed, what, what? Uh, if I said, Ahmed is nice, that'll be a meaningful sentence, right? Ahmed, help me, that'll be a meaningful sentence. Uh, any, uh, anything would be acceptable, but just to repeat Ahmed, doesn't make sense. Now, when we remember Allah, when you say SubhanAllah, does it mean something? It's a full meaning. It's a complete sentence. Alhamdulillah. La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar. La hawla wa la quwata la billah. Every one of them is a meaningful, profound statement. But to repeat the name of Allah Azza wa Jal endlessly, for hours they do it, sometimes thousands of times, does not make any sense. And it is me, it is a mean of degrading and belittling the majesty of Allah. By calling Him, calling Him and not saying what you want. But that's what they do. And one of the du'at, he went to Zaytuna Institute, which is ran by Hamza Yusuf, one of the biggest, you know, very, very prominent speakers in the English world. Many people don't know, they listen to Hamza Yusuf, he has some good and bad, like everybody else, he has some good and bad, but in his Zaytuna Institute, it's a college, which, you know, they teach Islamic, uh, you know, uh, material, one of the du'at went to advise him, went to their, his school and he found the poor students, the students in the class sitting there saying Allah, 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 Allah endlessly. You wouldn't think that's the case? That is the case. In the manhaj of the, if you go to zaytunainstitute.org on the website, they teach Al-Qasida, Al-Burda, this, this poem which includes shirk. 
and we will deal with it later. This is part of their manhaj that they teach to the students. There's no doubt about the deviance of such behavior. The Sufis recite love poems mentioning the names of women and boys, sometimes in their qasida, and they use words like desire, lust, love, passion, different kind of stuff, not very common, but it is there as well. Uh, some Sufis pierce themselves with rods of iron. They, some of them put glass, they walk on it. You know like the magicians pull these stunts? They do the same thing. And I've seen this again with my own eyes. They, you know, some of them will put, uh, one guy will actually go, he goes around with like what, what looks like a knife. It's like a rod. And then people are dancing in the middle of the dhikr. And you, you know, then he will come and he will put it in his neck. Like this, and the person will start bleeding and he's still happy, you know, dancing around. Then he'll go to the neck. He's just stabbing people around, right? And everybody's like happy. Okay, finally I got my share. You know, everybody's bleeding around. Who does it remind you of? Who does that remind you of? Shia. Shia, you see pictures of children, two-year-old children with his head cut in, in half. With a sword. You know, because you know, the Hassan and Hussein and... Shirk. Shirk. Not Islam. Wallahi, not Islam. Nothing to do with Islam. And Allah said, وَمَنْ يَعْشُ عَنْ ذِكْرِ الرَّحْمَانِ نُقَيِّدْ لَهُ شَيْطَانًا فَهُوَ لَهُ قَرِيمٌ Yeah, they, they, they get this done with the aid of the shayateen. Just like David Copperfield and many other of these magicians, they do actual magic. Now we believe in magic in Islam. We believe someone can disappear from here with the help of the jinn and the shayateen. We have no doubt. It's not trickery. It's not just, you know, tricks uh, that, you know, like the people cannot see. We believe in magic. Magic is something that we don't deny. It's shirk, it's kufr, it will throw you outside of Islam, but it does exist. So we don't doubt that someone will make a helicopter disappear with the help of the jinn. It is possible because Allah gave the jinn such authority and power as means of testing them. And we know if you read the Quran, you see what happened with Sulaiman. The jinn used to do all kinds of things for, things for him that human beings could not do. Even the throne of, of you know, the uh, Balqis, you know, he, they were able to bring it from, from a huge distance. Afritun min al jinn. So we don't doubt. We don't doubt. So yes, the Sufis may do this with the help of the shayateen. And Allah said, whoever turns away from the remembrance of Allah, we will assign for him a devil, so he will become his close companion. And yes, they will be able to pull all kinds of stunts that the common people will think it's actually some amazing, you know, uh, guidance from Allah. The Sufis claim to have what is known as Nasis or knowledge of the unseen. Some of them say, you know, I remember, I read this also myself, the, the Mufti of Syria back then, I'm not able to recall his name right now, very famous, very famous. He said, he told the story how he met the Sheikh, then when, when, he, when he first met the Sheikh, the, when he first came in, the Sheikh said, I've been waiting for you for a long time. You know, can you imagine? He go to, you know, your manager at work for the first time. He said, I've been waiting for you for a long time. Ahmed Mustafa, you were born, you were born in the year 1972. You know, blah, blah, blah. You're like, oh my God, you know, what is this guy? This is, you know, this is person, it's a psychic. Yeah, with the jinn, with the jinn. They believe that they, the, their Sufi masses, they know the present, past, future, they know everything. They know everything. And he will narrate to you a bunch of stuff. Like just like, you know, palm reading and all this uh, fortune telling and the horoscopes, it's the same idea. Integrated, you'll find that Sufism have picked up some from Hinduism and some from the Greek philosophy and some from the Christianity. They've picked up their religion from a number of places, you know, mumbo jumbo kind of thing, put them all together in one and they called it Sufism. And they have the nerve to call people to it. And they call anyone who doesn't like them, Wahhabi. And on their websites, you go to the websites, you see the tab. They have Aqidah, Seerah, Fiqh, Wahhabism. You know? So, so, you know, that's part of the thing. It's part of the thing because if they don't warn against the other people, right? If they don't warn against them, then basically they will lose their audience. So the first thing that they do is that they warn people from the religion, from, from any other person. And any other person who's not a Sufi is automatically a Wahhabi. Whether he follows Muhammad Abdul Wahhab or he doesn't, that doesn't matter. If he's not a Sufi, he's a Wahhabi. So this is their, the way they do it. They scare the people away because they're afraid that they will lose their audience. 
The Sufis claim that Allah created the world for the sake of Muhammad sallallahu This is a very common practice among the average Muslim in a masjid in Saudi Arabia. That Allah created the dunya and the heavens and the earth for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And that this was written on the throne. And that, you know, the first thing Allah created was the light of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And that he is the perfect man. Some of the Sufis say that the Prophet sallallahu has the attributes of Allah. Has the attributes of Allah. He is the perfect man and perfect divine being in one. So the, to them, the Messenger of Allah is better than Allah. A'udhu Billah. And this is a very common belief among many people that have been inf influenced by the Sufis without even knowing. Without even knowing. They believe that the Prophet ﷺ, Allah created the dunya for his sake. And Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا We were, Allah only created the, the everything, the jinn and the ins, and the dunya for them, so that they may worship him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, the Prophet ﷺ is the best human being Allah ever created. We don't deny that. But Allah did not create the dunya for him. Allah told us why he created the dunya. On the other hand, he said to the Prophet ﷺ, وَاعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ And worship and enslave yourself to your master until death comes to you. That's what he was commanded ﷺ. The Sufis claim that they can see Allah in this life. They can see Allah in this life. And Allah told us when Musa asked for that, Allah told him, قَالَ رَبِّي أَرِنِي أَنظُرْ إِلَيْ قَالَ لَن تَرَانِي Musa said, Oh my, my Allah, Oh Allah, Rabbi, my master, allow me to look at you. Allah told him, You will not be able to see me. No one can see Allah in the dunya. No one can see Allah in the dunya. The believers will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah. On the day of judgment and in Jannah. And this should be the goal of every Muslim. This is a side note. Every Muslim's ultimate goal should be looking at Allah Jalla Jalalu. Because there will be no pleasure, no pleasure in the dunya, in the Jannah, like that pleasure. There will be no pleasure like the pleasure of at looking at what, be, what better than looking at Allah Azza wa Jal. And what prevents us from going there? Sometimes the, the easiest things in the deen. The easiest teachings of Islam, many of us are, are unable to carry them out, yet we claim that we love Allah and we wish to see Him on the Day of Judgment. If so, then why are we not doing the most basic teachings of Islam to attain this, this goal? Allah had made it easy. All we have to do is adhere to the best of our ability. Many things we can do that we don't do. And that indicates that we really don't look forward to meeting Allah. We don't really look forward to it. We don't think that this moment is so special that this whole dunya is insignificant, as the Sahaba believed. And consequently, we are running behind. The Sufis claim that they take knowledge directly from Allah. One of them will say, حَدَّثَنِي قَلْبِي عَنْ رَبِّي my, my heart has spoken to me concerning my master, which is Allah. Notice now, what do you read in the books of Hadith? حَدَّثَنَا حدثنا حدثنا أن عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال. But he doesn't say, you know, I, I, he doesn't need narrations. He doesn't need hadith. He gets the hadith straight from his heart, and his heart gets it straight from Allah. Inspiration. They receive inspiration, just like the messengers receive inspiration. And we know that this can never be the case. The Sufi celebrate Maulid. And hold gatherings for sending blessings on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And we dealt with the lecture. Can I celebrate this about the Mawlid? And we mentioned why this is not not from the Sunnah. But it doesn't end with the celebration. It's not only the concept of celebrating. It's the idea, or the idea is what happens during these celebrations. What happens during these celebrations is that uh, among the poems that are recited is Qasidat al Burda. You know what this Qasida says? It says, Ya Akram al Khalqi, Mali Mindunika bihi aludu. O most noble of creation, who besides you do I seek refuge with? And what do you say when you want to recite the Quran? A'udhu billahi min al shaytan al rajim. Whenever calamity befalls you, you seek refuge with who? Who do you seek protection from? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this poem, the, by, by Al Bosiri, Al Waisiri, the one who authored this poem, which is famous among the Sufis, taught in Zaytuna Institute, it says that who at the time of need 
do I seek besides you, O Messenger of Allah? Then he goes on to say, وَمِنْ عُلُومِكَ عِلْمُ اللَّوْحِ وَالْقَلَمِ And listen, listen now. Part of your knowledge, the Messenger of Allah, part of your knowledge is the knowledge of the preserved tablet and the pen. What did they leave for Allah? Who, know, who knows Allah al mahfuz Only Allah. When, when Jibreel told him, Akhbarni an al sa'a what did he tell him? Mal mas'oolu anha bi a'lam min al sail Jibreel told him, tell me about the hour, the day of judgment. He said, the one you're asking has no more knowledge than the one asking. I don't know. They say part of your knowledge. Now, the knowledge of Allah, Azza wa Jal, is the preserved tablet and the pen. Allah commanded for the pen to write everything. They say part of his knowledge is the knowledge of the pen and the preserved tablet. This is shirk. This is major shirk in the poem. And this burda is the most favorite for the Sufis during the celebration of Mawlid. It is recited and you find it on YouTube with different munshideen doing the same qasida over and over again. There's a special one done by Hamza Yusuf himself. This shirki qasida which gives the Prophet ﷺ the attributes of Allah. That's what happens in the Mawlid. And you know the Hadra, you know the Hadra, everybody will be sitting, remembering Allah in some fashion, all of a sudden everybody stands. Why did they stand? The Messenger of Allah just paid them a visit. They say that the Messenger of Allah just came, so they stand in honor to him, alayhi salatu salam. That's Sufism. That's Sufism for you. The Sufis travel to visit graves and seek blessings from the occupants or to make tawaf. You go to some of the masajid in Syria. I've been there myself. When my family first started practicing, because we were like semi-Christians in my country, it's like we were like Islam was like just a, something on a passport, right? When we started practicing, the only available teachings in, in my country was Sufi, Sufi teachings. And what was the first, things we, the first thing we did? We went to Maqam Sitna Zainab in Syria. We went to the shrine of Zainab in Syria. You go there and see what the people do. You know, wiping, just like the people do in the Kaaba. Even around the Kaaba, this is not allowed. These people do it around the shrine of a person in the masjid. It's in the masjid, not outside, not next door, in the house of Allah. People calling on the Sitna Zainab, who may not even be buried there. Okay, this is what is happening. They seek help from them. The Prophet وسلم, and they travel long distances for that. Even though the Prophet وسلم, said that لا تشد الرحال, that you should not take a journey except for three masajid, Mecca, Medina, and Masjid Al-Aqsa. These are the only three masajid where you can pack and actually travel with the intent to pray there. Anything else? No. But they go. To, we went to that masjid for Sitna Zainab which the Prophet ﷺ said that we're not supposed to do. And they do this to Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, Rifa'i, al-Badawi in Egypt. Made two million people every year maybe go around and do tawaf around his qabr. Tawaf around his qabr. Wal'iyadu billah. Shirk. We will deal in the next lecture, inshallah, more with that. Allah said, however, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ تَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ عِبَادٌ أَمْثَالُكُمْ فَادْعُوهُمْ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Verily, those who you call on besides Allah are slaves like yourselves. So call on them and let them respond to you if you are truthful. Anyone you call on besides Allah is a slave like you. He, whether he's alive or dead. Whether he is big or small, whether he is virtuous or not, anyone you call on besides Allah is a abd like you, Jibreel, Mikael, Israfil, or anyone else is a slave like you. Allah said, so call on them and let them respond to you if you are truthful. That's Allah's challenge. The shayateen will respond, but they will not respond. Because it's only Allah Azza wa Jal who responds to the supplication of the one who supplicates. The Sufis are fascinated with, with uh, you know, amulets and numbers and hanging, you know, all kinds of stuff. And we dealt with the lecture, Shirk undercover with the details of that. You know, again, you know, they believe and, and they put their trust in Quranic ayat that they hang on their, you know, clothing and so on and so forth. Again, they seek blessings from the Prophet Wasallam, and they invented a special way of sending Salat and Salam. They don't have, if you some of their books, a whole book of like 300 pages of innovated ways of saying Allahumma salli wa sallim ala nabiyana Muhammad. 
And we have been taught by the Prophet ﷺ specifically how to do it. Right? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama salli ala Ibrahim wa Ali Ibrahim. Or we have many different formulas from the Messenger of Allah. But this is not sufficient for them. They invent new ones and new ones and new ones. And this is the thing. Then they sit in a gathering and they sing them together thinking they will get closer to Allah. Jalla Jalal. Right. We're almost there. Let me give you, these are the Sufis. And no Muslim who fears Allah and look, looks forward to meeting Allah on the Day of Judgment should continue on any of these ways if he wishes to be among the people of Jannah automatically. If someone wants to be punished first, if they die upon Tawheed, they may practice some of these innovations. If someone wants to guarantee Jannah, then these innovations are never to be practiced by a Muslim. Let me give you some contemporary Sufi practices by Sunnis who may not know that these practices are Sufis. If I'm going to say something you have done before, don't worry, I didn't see you. But I probably will mention some things. One of the first one is, you know that one, right? I just saw it the day before yesterday. Was it the day? I think just in the masjid. You know, right? Uh, I was uh, uh, at the masjid the adhan, and there was a brother sitting right there in the second row. And as soon as he heard, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah ala tool, he kissed his thumbs and he rubbed his eyes. Of course, I went and had a little conversation with him afterwards. Alhamdulillah, he was humble enough to accept the advice. Some people get upset with you, say, Who are you to tell me? And this is, you know, Maulana told me this, and you are not Maulana, and you look very young to be a Maulana, and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, oh, You will not get to any, you know, end. So, you know, this we leave aside. Kissing the thumbs. This is a very common Sufi practice done by many people, not from the Sunnah of the Prophet. And the ironic thing is that I, I really wanted to know what they based it on. So I googled it and I found a huge article with around a hundred fabricated narrations going all the way back to Adam. And Adam was the first one to do it, according to them. Back when Allah created the Prophet ﷺ and something, so he kissed and he said, whoever does this. And you know, and the funny thing is, read, read the references. Kitab al-Balbili, you know, page... What is Kitab al-Balbili, man? What is this? Where's Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Nasa'i, Abu Dawood? Give me, give me a hadith. Give me a muhadith. They just, any person who writes a book, I can author a book right now, call it IMC. And then you go circulating the stuff on it. Wallah, you know, in the book IMC, you know, it says, Tayyib, I could come up with this on my own. Fabricated narrations, nothing authentic. You will never find anything. You will not even find a hadith that is da'if. You know, if you find one in Abu Dawood, but da'if, we will have at least a, a debate. We can say, Wallah, some of the ulama of hadith, they said this hadith sahih. Nothing. But they have to come up, now they have to support their view. They fabricate narrations. They lie against the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. See what, see what innovations will lead you to? Next, congregational dua. Very common elsewhere, alhamdulillah. We ask Allah for the, this day never to come. Where the Imam will turn around after the salah and raise his hands and everybody makes dua with him in the kingdom. We hope this will never come. But this is very common elsewhere in the Muslim world. People don't know subhanahu wa astaghfirullah three times, no subhanahu wa thirty three times. Ala tool, the Imam will turn around. Allahumma taqabbal minna inna ka the dua and everybody says Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. Then everybody wipes their face and everybody gets up and they leave. Bid'ah. Bid'ah practiced by the Sufis, not from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. How many years was he leading the Sahaba in Salah? Not even once did he do this. Not even once, once, once. And whoever claims otherwise, bring your proof. Go show us the authentic narration, you will not find it. But very common practice among the Sufis. S thirdly, yaqawi, 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 yaqawi. Right? They must be saying it so fast, because I look at them, and in three seconds his, head, his hand is off his head. He must have been saying, yaqawi, 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 yaqawi. <laughs> Because if you're going to say, yaqawi, 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 ya that's like a 30 seconds. But you will never find him doing it for 30 seconds. It's usually three or four, unless they're afraid of us. <laughs> you know, they think that some Sunni will see me, so he wants to get it done quickly. Allahu A'lam. Either way, where did this yaqawi come from? Allahu A'lam. Allahu A'lam. Very common among the Sufis, not from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Next in line. Rocking back and forth. Whether one remembering Allah, or one reciting the Quran, you see, go in the Quran, you see him, you know, reading the Quran like this. Now, you know who initiated this? 
the Jews. Go to the internet and watch the Jews how they read their Torah before the wall in, in uh, Jerusalem. They go like this. So this particular act, besides the fact that it's resembling the Kuffar, which we're not supposed to do in any way, shape or form, it is actually now an innovation in the sense that we don't have any hadith that for you to recite the Quran or remember Allah, you need to rock back and forth. So this whole concept that people cannot stand still when re remembering Allah or reciting the Quran and they find the urge to move is actually a habit. It's a habit, you can stop it. I know in the beginning your body is used to it, but if you were to train yourself a few times, you'll find you have no problem reading the Quran like this and you don't have to move. Rocking back and forth is not from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, very common among the Sufis. Chanting the Dua. You cannot make regular Dua. It has to be in a form of chanting, like song-like or recitation-like. And even though, even though some of the ulama have differed, I have to convey to you the position which I hold to be sound, and you may disagree with that if you're following an imam which is known, known to be upon the sunnah, no problem. Some of them say it's okay to recite the dua in the fashion that you hear today in taraweeh. And some of them say this is not from the sunnah. You should just make regular dua, Rabbana khfir lana warhamna wa tub alayna ya rabbal alameen. But to make it into recitation, the same way you read the Quran, some of the ulama say this is not from the sunnah and it is very much close to the, the way the Sufis do their dua. But again, to be, to be you know, honest, some of the ulama of the sunnah say there's no harm in it. If you are convinced that this is sahih, alhamdulillah. Because it is not only among the Sufis, right? But just to let you know that this is also practiced among the Sufis. Wiping the face after dua. Wiping the face after dua. There's no sahih hadith that the Prophet ﷺ would wipe his face after making dua. Now it's a very common practice among the Muslims that they must raise their hand after the obligatory salah or even the voluntary. And keep in mind that there's no authentic narration not about the, not about the farida or the nafila that ever the Prophet ﷺ raised his hands and made dua. The sunnah is that you make dua without raising the hands. But raising the hands is an innovation in of itself. Then to add to that, to wipe your face with it, or some people, you know, they rub first or they blow, all this is not from the sunnah among the Sufis. One person which I know, he goes to extreme. He will, he will undo his shirt, three buttons, you know, and he will go like this, he'll put his head in the shirt and go. <laughs> Why? Why? Where did that come from? Yes, the Messenger of Allah, before going to sleep, before going to sleep, he would recite, Kul huwa Allahu ahad, Kul a'udhu bi rabbil falak, Kul a'udhu bi rabbil nas, then he would spit on his hand, not really saliva, but like, like this, then he would actually wipe his face, head, and whatever he can of his body, before he went to sleep, alayhi salatu salam, only, not while making dua. He didn't do this after salah. And he didn't teach us that every time you make dua, you should wipe your body with it, or you should blow, your, blow in your body. This is another Sufi based bid'ah which has no basis in the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Conclusion Allah said وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلَ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ And verily this is my straight path so follow it and do not follow other paths otherwise it will mislead you from my path. And keep in mind that the path of Allah is difficult. The path of Allah requires effort. The path of Allah is not a shortcut. In the Sufi circle, there are shortcuts. Sheikh Nazim, you know what he told his followers? He said that when, when it's time for you to die, it will not be the angel of death who will take your soul. I will take your soul and give it to the angels. <laughs> eh Allah. Eh Allah. Then he went on to say, that when the angels ask you in the grave, Munkar and Nakir, who is your Lord? What is your religion? And what do you say about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? I will whisper to you the answer. Shortcut. Basically, follow me blindly, I will take you to Jannah. Shortcut. But that's not the way of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The way of Allah, Ya ayyuha al-insanu innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan famulaqi. O oh, son of Adam, you will be striving and make an effort towards your Lord until you meet him. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ We have created human beings in toil, in, in difficulty, in hardship. It is not going to be easy. But when we make it there, it will be worthwhile. 
That effort for the sunnah, to stay upon the sunnah will be worthwhile. If you don't get the reward today, you will get it on with Allah on the day of judgment. But we have to strive, no shortcuts. The Prophet sallallahu said, تَرَكْتُكُمْ عَلَى الْمَحَجَّةِ الْبَيْضَةِ لَيْلُهَا كَنَهَارِهَا لَا يَزِيغُ عَنْهَا إِلَّا هَالِكُ I have left you upon a white plain. Its night is like its day. None will deviate from it except one who is destroyed. If you go away from the sunnah, you are bound to be destroyed. Per the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He said, woe to you from introducing anything into Islam. He warned us alayhi salatu wasalam. He said, مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ فَسَيَرَ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِّينَ تَمَسَّكُوا بِهَا وَعَضُّوا بِهَا عَلَى النَّوَاجِدِ Whoever amongst you live after me shall see a lot of differences. So upon you is my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa. Hold on it and bite on it with your molar teeth. All the way in your mouth, bite on the sunnah. When you see what? Differences. When you see differences, new way of worshipping Allah, new way of remembering Allah, you know, Sufi master, tariqa, you know, calling on dead people. Where did that come from? You will not find this in the, in the way of the Salaf. You will not find this among the righteous predecessors. No, no such thing among in their lives. All these were introduced after the early generations. Allah says, Hold on to the rope of Allah, to the book of Allah altogether, and do not split up, do not divide. Do not separate from the path of Allah. Allah says, or do they have partners who legislate for them, who introduce into them, into the religion, that which Allah did not allow? Allah did not allow for, for you to worship Him in this way. You bring someone else and you know He teaches you how to worship Allah. He legislates on behalf of Allah. So my brothers in Islam, and sisters in Islam, the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa is clear. Wallahi. And the ulama who propagated are known and famous. The ulama of hawa, of desires and deviance and innovations are also known. And you cannot confuse the two. We need to stick to the ulama of the sunnah who love the sunnah, practice the sunnah. How you will know? You will find that they will never tell you to do anything that is not in the sunnah. This is very easy way of identifying where to go. If he quotes an ayah or a hadith with the understanding of the righteous predecessors, this is the alim of a sunnah. If he tells you Maulana said and Ma Sufi master said and I think and I believe, then this is the dalal. This is the deviance and misguidance. And this is what they teach. They teach, you know, the relationship between the murid and the Sufi sheikh is that he's not supposed to ask him. Even if you see him drinking wine, he should think in himself, this is Pepsi. This is Pepsi, it cannot be wine. Don't ask the Shaykh. Because if you ask him, you'll be deprived of the blessing. This is how they subdue, how they enslave these people to them. Websites that you need to be careful of that propagate this extreme Sufism, this mystic Sufism. Sunnah.org. And wallahi, they have nothing to do with the Sunnah. May Allah guide them. Sunnah.org, don't go to that site. Sunni path, it is not the path of the Sunnah. Call it Sufi path if you like. Sunnipath.com, another deviant website. The modern religion, that tells you the whole thing. The modern religion, so there's an old school religion and a modern religion. You know, we bring you the new stuff. The way to truth is the way to hell. It is not the way to truth.org. Islam rocks. Just in case, you know, you like, you know, rock bands and you are one of these, you know, cool hippies, that's a cool website for you. Uh, it's Isra International. And they had, you know, on, uh, during the uh, Isra and Mi'raj, or what is claimed to be Isra and Mi'raj, we don't even have any Sahih reference that it was on the 27th of Rajab. You know, their website, the main page, is all about celebrating Isra and Mi'raj. And this is where uh, Sheikh Qabbani was blessing the Indonesian people during that particular event. And Zaytuna.org, that of Hamza Yusuf, very huge speaker in the English world. You find him on YouTube, you find him everywhere. People may not know because in the beginning he was alright, then his things got worse and worse. And we ask Allah to guide all of them. Keep in mind when we make this, when we mention these things, some of people, you know, said, why do you mention names? Well, go back to Imam Nawawi's book, Riyadh al-Salihin, open the chapter of backbiting and learn the six exceptions of backbiting. One of them is warning the Muslims against potential deviance and harm. 
These names are being mentioned not to defame them, but so the people will know where to go when they want to learn the Sunnah. Simultaneously, we're hoping that when their name is mentioned, one of their students will say, Hey, my Sheikh, some guy named Abu Mus'ab spoke about you in his lecture. And he will say, Oh yeah, what did he say? Here's his, what, here's his DVD, here's his lecture, maybe he will watch and Allah will guide him. That's what I hope. So I have two intentions by mentioning names and websites. Not just to defame them, but so that we will know who we're dealing with and perhaps Allah will guide them to the truth. Because we quoted the evidences which are in contrast with their, with their prevalent teachings. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Wa nas'alullahu jalla jalalu wa taqaddasat asma wa yahdi jami'a al-muslimina lil-haq. Wa yiruddana ila dinihi raddan jamilan. Wa yudkhilna jannat al-na'im innahu waliyu thalika wal qadiru alayhi. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad. How do we know, okay, we're still in the spiritual, the, the acceptable the actions, and we haven't fallen into the extreme? Barakallah, good question. The brother is asking, how do we know, you know, when we have went too far, like the Sufis? Because we know that the issue of spirituality is something that is totally Islamic. We're not just a bunch of, you know, machines doing salah and everything where the body is in involved and the spirit has nothing to do with it. We, what we work on is actually tazkiyah to nafs, purifying the soul. How do you know, Akhi? The Quran and the Sunnah have the clearest teachings. The Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is clear in his spirituality. How when he would read, he would listen to the Quran ﷺ, he would cry. How he would go for some days without eating. How he wasn't concerned about the dunya. How he would give and give and give. This is the concept of asceticism, zuhud, and detachment from the dunya. It's manifest and embodied in the practice of the Prophet ﷺ. Once someone wants to go beyond the sunnah, then this is when we start worrying. If someone says, I don't want to get married, we say the Messenger of Allah وسلم, got married, you better stick to the sunnah. If he said, I want to fast every day, fast every day, we say the Messenger of Allah used to fast some days and he would break his fast on other days. If he says, I want to remember Allah, you know, a million times, or you know, I want to say subhanAllah 500 times, we say the Messenger of Allah said 100 times. Or if you want to add more, add more without keeping count. Don't think that it must be 500. Don't be attached to a number. So the sunnah is clear. If one wants to know how to revive his spiritual being, how to get you know, closer to Allah Azza wa Jal through worshipping him, then let him follow the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his sahaba and the tabi'een. You will find what will suffice you there. Once we add anything, then we need to quit. I hope that answers the question inshallah. Yes sir. No, no, this is, you know, the wasila or the wasta or the shafa'a, meaning, you know, bijahi, or Allah I ask you through the, through the honor of such and such person in your side. We, next lecture, inshallah, which is on the 26th of July, uh, will actually address this particular topic. So let's leave it until then. But just in case one of us died before then, then let me tell you that no. You ask Allah directly, you don't put anyone in between you and Allah. Yes, sir. Question. Uh, you have mentioned earlier regarding the supplication. So when will be the time to rest the hand, raise the hand? Um, because sometimes during prayer, especially Kudu, they're doing raising the hand. So no, during salah, the raising the hands is like this. Okay, so that's that raising the hand is not actually dua. This is because the sunnah is that you raise your hands to the chest or to where the, the earlobes. That's the sunnah. We're speaking about raising the hands in dua. When it, it's to be done randomly, you do it right here, the right hand. Okay, now give me in the right hand. Uh, you do it, Habibi, without trying to attach it to another act of worship. Once you say, okay, after every adhan, I have to raise my hands. After every nafil, I have to raise my hands. After every, every time I do this, once you associate it with another act of worship and you do it consistently, you have fallen into bid'ah. If you do it just naturally, it's a natural thing. Let's say we get in the car and we're traveling and I know the dua of the travel is accepted and now it's the sunnah to raise your hand while making dua, I just raise my hands. You see, one day you're just sitting in the masjid, you're waiting for the iqamah and you want to make dua, you raise your hand. 
But to make it a habit, every time, every time, at this stage, after this act of worship, or before this act of worship, I must raise my hands, then you are adding something that the Prophet ﷺ didn't do. You see the criteria? Inshallah. That's a nice piece of paper. Where do I begin? After the Friday, uh, two separate questions. Yes? Okay. After the Friday khutbah, when the Imam does the dua, should one just say Ameen without raising the hands? Precisely. Precisely. Not the Imam, nor the Ma'moom, should ever raise their hands in Jumu'ah. And one of the Salaf, one of the righteous predecessors, one, the one given khutbah, raised his hands in the dua, he actually stopped him in the middle of the dua. And he made dua, he said, you know, we may, I don't remember the exact words, but it wasn't very cool. He wasn't happy with him. He said, verily, the Messenger of Allah never did anything beyond raise his finger and dua. So you don't raise your hands as a khatib, and surely, surely the ones who are attending the khutbah should not raise their hands either, be it men or women. This is not from the Sunnah, the Sahaba never did that. And their way is the best way. You can say Ameen with a low voice. Not screaming in a, you know, uh, unanimously as they say, or in, in unison, all of us together we say, Ameen, Ameen. This is not from the Sunnah either. You just say, Ameen, Ameen. On your own, not as a group of Muslims. Second question, should one take the good and leave the bad from these people, such as Arabic Tajweed and general benefits that can be taken from them, and stay away from the innovations? Well, if you are a student of knowledge, you are well, you know, firmly grounded in knowledge, and you have the means to do so, even then it is, uh, it is advised that you don't and you get it from the people of the Sunnah. Let alone if it's one of us, laymen. If one of, it's one of the regular people, whether it's a male or female, then for sure we should not refer to them because you don't know, as they say, the poison will be in the cake. You don't know where you will learn the bid'ah. You don't know where you will be misled because you don't have any reference, you don't know any better. So my advice to you is no. Alhamdulillah, Allah has sufficed us with many people on the Sunnah who teach Tajweed and who teach Arabic and who teach everything in general. We do not need to refer to the people of innovation to learn these sciences. We do not need to do so. Allah has sufficed us because you don't know where you will be led astray. And as we know from the righteous predecessors like Muhammad ibn Sirin, rahimahullah, who died in the year 110, he was sitting down with some of his students, some two muqtadi'ah, two from the people of innovation came in and they wanted to speak to him. He said, Im la anni aw la aqum. Either you will leave or I will leave. Either you will leave or I will leave. So they said, let us just read some Quran. He said, not even Quran. Don't even read any Quran. Either you will leave or I will leave. When they left, his student said, Ya Shaykh, what is, what is wrong with them reciting the Quran? He said, I was afraid they would read the book of Allah, twist the meaning in it, and the sickness will remain in, it, in my heart. They will, they will cause some deviation in the ayah, which will remain in my heart. I don't need to hear this. Either you will leave or I will leave. Now today this is a little tough because you know, predominantly the innovators are more than the people on the Sunnah. So if you do this, you wind up boycotting the Muslims. We don't want to boycott the Muslims. You want to call them to the Sunnah. But as for us, we take the knowledge from the people of the Sunnah. I can give you references and substitutes for all of these. That you can learn without having to take their knowledge from them. Wallahu ta'ala ala. Any other question? Yes. This is a big bid'ah, which I used to do almost all my life. Imagine we would, we would actually, we would desert the graves, which is a sunnah, to visit the graves on the day of Eid. The day, of, the day where you're actually supposed to have fun, we go to the grave. People go to the grave on the day of Eid. And the grave is actually a moment of, you know, not a moment of, 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 of entertainment, per se. So this is, I mean, and it's not from the Sunnah. The Prophet never visited dead people on Eid, right? We had Salatul Eid and the Fatiha. I remember I said Fatiha for most people is fill in the blanks. Anytime they don't know what to say, they squeeze the Fatiha in. 
It is not from the Sunnah to recite the Fatiha at the grave of any dead person. It is not from the Sunnah to recite the Fatiha upon a dying person. It is not the Sunnah to recite Fatiha when you get engaged or married. It is not the Sunnah to recite Fatiha in many different cases where people do it. When can you recite the Fatiha? When someone is sick and you want to do Ruqya on them, you recite Surah Al-Fatiha. When you are in Salah, you recite Surah Al-Fatiha. When you teach your children, you recite Surah Al-Fatiha. That's it. But to go on and add it everywhere, no Habib. And anyone who claims otherwise, as Allah says, قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْهَانَكُمْ in kuntum sadiqin, say produce your evidence. Show me when did the Prophet ﷺ first go to the graveyard on Eid. Then show me when did he pray, use the Fatiha or recite the Fatiha at the grave site. When they give us these two evidences, tomorrow all of us will go together. This next Eid, I promise. But they will not be able to do, do it because it's not from the Sunnah. Inshallah. Yes, sir. Uh, some of the people say the all elders that uh, reading the Ruth Sharif. A lot. It's very nice, especially on the day of Friday. Well, the Prophet ﷺ confirmed that. Saying, sending plenty and abundant of salat and salam is definitely from the Sunnah. One of the Sahaba said, you know, you know, nisf. Shall I, you know, my remembrance to Allah, shall I make half of it, a quarter of it first, like, you know, sending salam on you? He said, you know, that's fine and you can add. Anyways, he continued until he said the whole thing. He said, when really Allah will forgive you sin and he will suffice your need. So there's no harm. He said, for example, you know, on the day of Jumu'ah, this is a special day and he mentioned the virtue of Yawm al-Jumu'ah. فَأَكْثِرُ مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَنَّ صَلَاتَكُمْ مَعْرُوضَةٌ عَلَيْهِ So then send a lot of salam on me on the day of Jumu'ah because it will be presented to me by the angels. Allah will return his soul to him so he can return the salam to you. No doubt, Akhi. No doubt that it is a sunnah to say Allahumma salli wa sallim ala nabiyyana Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama sallayit ala Ibrahim until the end. No harm. But not we come together in a circle and we do it in unison and not in any other innovated formulas. Right? And not by thinking that, you know, the Prophet will answer our dua by saying that. So if we take away these shirki, you know, approaches, then yes, that's the sunnah for sure. What about hearing uh, a lot of the Sufi No, 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 this is, this, 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 there's nothing from the Sunnah which encourages the, the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha in particular. Not, I've read by the grace of Allah the tafsir of the ulama on this because I delivered a lecture on Fatiha. Yes. No, no sound reference about doing it abundantly in this fashion. No doubt, if you're doing it as a ruqya, but to walk around just saying Surah Al-Fatiha just like that, you know, then that, that's extremism in, in, the, in, the, in that. If you're trying to seek remedy, we already mentioned it's remedy. But not to go to extremes and you know, as the people do today. No. Yes, sister. Give the, they say ladies first. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. For we have actually evidences from the Sunnah that during uh, Dua al qunut whether you're praying by yourself at home in the Witr Salah or in the Jama'ah in Ramadan in Taraweeh, we have evidences about raising the hand. There is nothing wrong with raising the hand then. Alhamdulillah. Yes, this is from the Sunnah. And there are references to that. But uh, other times, then, you know, we go back to the same foundation I gave you earlier. Any other questions? Is it the intention of uh, having Salah? We can recite Surah Al-Fatiha because it's the Quran. Yeah, but see, then we, yes, of course, but the issue is people wind up, this is how it begins. Then it goes somewhere else. We just say generally, anything from the Quran you recite with the intention of seeking the reward is fine. We don't want to specify. Once you specify, then you fall into the same trap. Yeah. Yes, sir. What is the difference between shirk and kufr? If we can tell somebody this is shirk or this is kufr. So well, is safe or uh, is different? No, not necessarily. Every kufr is shirk. But not every shirk, uh, I mean, every shirk is kufr, but not every kufr is shirk. Every shirk is kufr, but not every kufr is shirk. Kufr can be, for example, being uh, ungrateful to Allah. Being ungrateful to Allah. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you are worshipping others, others with Allah. Shirk specifically means that you have someone that you worship along with Allah. Kufr is to deny. To deny something. For example, 
Someone will tell you that the Prophet Sallallahu said that you, you know, you need, you, you cannot wear a golden ring. And someone will do kufur in that. He said, I don't believe that. And I will wear a golden ring. That's not necessarily shirk as in he worshipped, uh, he worshipped others with Allah. But that's an act of kufr which is denial, rejection, and hiding the truth. Okay? But they can be used interchangeably. Usually they're almost synonymous. But you know, don't go into the technicality. You just say this act of yours is an act of kufr. You know, it's an act of disbelief. And you don't say you're a disbeliever. Because we cannot, even whatever I mentioned among these people, I cannot say any Sufi is a disbeliever. A scholar can give him, you know, that title after he gives him da'wah and he refuses. We're saying what they're doing are acts of shirk and kufr. The individuals, their affair is with Allah. You know, that's none of my business to come and declare people as kuffar. So if you are telling the this book, so we are telling to him, he's a kufr. Perfect. No, because the ulama have a principle. For example, not everyone who practices innovation is an innovator. You may have been taught something by your culture that you think is a sunnah and you're actually doing an innovation. But can I call you an innovator? No, because you don't have the intention to innovate in the deen of Allah. You don't know any better. You get it? So they're not, you know, it's not that easy or simple. Yes, Akhi? Uh, a lot of people Sufi sectors, they argue that in Quran Sharif, it's uh, only Allah this mentioned. Awliya? Okay, we agree. We agree. What are the, what are the awliya? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, we've uh, always heard, heard of Sufi saints like Hazrat Abdul Qadir Shah Jilani and Khawaja Mohammed Chisri. These people, they have done, uh, converted a lot of Hindus in. That part of the world, you know. I'm, I'm originally from India myself. Okay. And, uh, in that sector, we've always heard from our elders, <coughs> from our grandfathers, that these people were very big saints. We're aware of that. Yeah. Now, I, I know what you're going. I know where you're going just to save you the trouble. We don't deny that some of the individuals who are labeled as awliya may have been actual awliya of Allah, as in they were righteous people. But the problem Aki, is that the concept of Waliullah does not stop, stop with him. For example, I can say Shaykh Rasab ibn Taymiyyah, we believe is one of the awliya of Allah. Because he's Shaykh Rasab. But does that mean that I go to his grave and hope that I get some blessing from him? No. So the issue is that it doesn't stop with Waliullah. Now that he's Wali, you expect something in. You know, you expect something. There's, there's a continuity for that. If we only stop there, yeah. Maybe some of these shuyukh were major shuyukh. We don't deny. You want me to make some effort, huh? My dear brother, I will exercise with you later, inshallah. You see what I'm saying, Habibi? It doesn't end there. If it ended there, alhamdulillah, but it doesn't end there. Once they say he's wali, then you know the rest. Yeah, so the branching is wrong. Yeah, the whole thing. We cannot, akhi. Some of these people, Allah knows, may be, may be in the state of being burnt in the grave and the people outside are asking them for help. Akhi, you don't know. And many of the, you know, uh, late Sufis were heretics. You know, they were known as fornicators, all kinds of things. Their murids were not allowed to ask them why they were doing what they were doing. They died in that state and the murid still thinks that his sheikh is Baulana. And the man may be being punished in the grave. So, you know, we cannot say what is happening to this person in the grave. For me to give him a waliullah is tazkiyah. I don't have that, that knowledge, it's Allah's knowledge. You see, we say, Insha'Allah, we hope this was a righteous man. Insha'Allah, he's from the awliya of Allah. The same way a shaheed. We say, Insha'Allah, he's a shaheed. But you don't know. When the sahaba, when one died and they said, he's a shaheed, the Prophet said, no. He had stolen something. He had stolen something from the war booty. And he's being punished with it in the grave right now. And then he, he, he said, he denied the shahada for that man. You see? So that means we cannot can confirm wilaya or shahada to anyone unless we have a hadith that such and such person died as a shaheed or so on and so forth. Otherwise we say insha'Allah. Uh, Masha'Allah. Uh, wa alaykum salam. First come, first serve. Uh, some people visit their dead parents' grave annually to remember them and give food to the poor sadaqah during the time they died. So the deceased gets some reward. Is this permissible? Well, generally speaking, visiting the dead parents and making dua for them is okay. 
is recommended in fact, and this is the rights, among the rights which the parents have over us, that after they die, we don't forget about them. And we continue to ask Allah to forgive them and have mercy on them. Given sadaqah on behalf of the poor will also benefit them per the ahadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. إِذَا مَاتَ الْإِنسَانُ قَطَعَ عَمَلِهِ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثِ And he mentioned sadaqatun jariya. أو ولد يعني so the person can benefit from a sadaqa or from children who will make dua for them. In other narrations, one sahabiya told the Messenger of Allah, I know if my mother was alive, she would have given such and such a sadaqa. Can I do it on her behalf? He said, yes, and she, you will be rewarded and she will benefit. So because we have specific evidence about Umrah, Hajj, and sadaqa, then we say these things can benefit the dead. But recite in the Quran, no. Say, I'm going to recite just on behalf of my father, it will not reach him. I'm going to, uh, you know, do dhikr on behalf of my dead father, it's not going to help or no, nor is it going to reach him. And now anything else that people introduce will not be able to benefit them. We, are, we have specific exemptions from the sunnah concerning what will benefit them, which is dua for them, sadaqah on their behalf, uh, uh, hajj and umrah. Evidences are dealing with that and we stick to that. Wallahu alam. Can one increase in giving sadaqah during the month the parent died or should in a month be singled out? No, that would become an innovation. If you single out that month, you know, with that intent, then you are actually now adding something which is not taught by the sunnah. Give sadaqah all year round, generously, you know, for the sake of Allah, hoping that your parents will benefit. Don't specify the month that they died. Visiting graves for men. And visiting the graves is for men. Even though there's a difference of opinion among the ulama, la'ana zawaru, zawari, you know, the, the zawarat al-qubur and za'irat al-qubur, the ulama differed. Yes, the brother mentioned a, a, a valid point. Some of the ulama uh, restrict the visiting of the graves to men. And others say men and women. I personally have not leaned towards any position yet, so I cannot really impose it or share it with you yet. But yes, some of the ulama say it is only for men. So even the sisters should not be going to the grave sites at all. Some of the wisdoms behind that is that women are more emotional than men. They may lose their composure and lose their, you know, they may act in a manner that is not befitting at the grave site. Men seem to be a little more tough in these areas. So this is among the wisdoms and some of the narrations support that. That the Messenger of Allah cursed the women who visit graves. But then the term is Zawarat versus Zairat. Meaning ones who do it a lot versus ones who do it period. And they differ about the authenticity of the wording. It's a whole lecture of its own. Perhaps, inshallah, in the future we'll have a lecture about things dealing with the janazah and everything pertaining to that. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Um, I have read out articles by certain sheikh who call themselves Diobandi. Is this a deviant sect? Yes. Uh, yes, brother. Doing what? Niyaz, Niyaz. Niyaz? A charity or a goal is beginning in the name of Allah. For the person who has died, for the, for the, for the newborn babies, for their betterment in their life, visualize like the person who has died, for their sake, we, like, we give salah to the poor people in the name of Allah. Is that allowed? I, don't, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, like I mentioned earlier, if you see a, a person in the street, you give him five riyas and your intention that you give him the sadaqah also, you know, for you and on behalf of your parent, then that's all you need. Don't include anything else. Don't add anything else. It's a very simple transaction. Give sadaqah, hoping Allah will, will give him the reward because we have a hadith to that effect and we stay there. Adding other names or other ways of doing it, I don't know, of, I don't know, of, never heard the scholars discuss them, so we should strictly avoid them. Inshallah. He's just saying that Allah will heal the right blood. He's asking the question as it is written in the Quran, Allah will heal the right blood. Okay, this is in so sacrificial animals. People used to do like this in uh, support and they used to start animals in the name of Oliya and the center. Hey, no, well, that's shirk. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's, you know, فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَرْ قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ So to Allah pray and sacrifice and, and actually slaughter. Nahar is actually slaughtering. Say my, my prayer, my sacrifice, my living and my dead are for Allah the Lord of the worlds. So doing it for the sake of a wali or anything of this is major shirk that will throw someone outside the pales of Islam. Again this inshallah will be dealt with 
in the future lecture bi idnillah azza wa jalla just to uh, just like what you're saying is the practice is basically they make it like uh, some sweets and, and say okay this is the, on the name of such and such person the dead man. Not, yeah. So but this is like a wali supposedly. Right. Oh no, 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 so no. It's not even a sacrifice. It's not only animal. It could be any form and shape. It could be knafa. It could be knafa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, they said, you know, that. Yes. Does yes. that allow for, you know, I think it's a very excellent. Barakallah, Allah Mustaan. Since you have mentioned a few names uh, from the West and a lot of people, you know, from the Pakistan and India. Yes, please. There are a few names, literally, you know, on the same path, same thing. Uh, one of the names from Pakistan is, uh, he calls himself Sheikh al-Islam as well. And his title is Sheikh al-Islam, literally, Allama, uh, Tahir al-Qadri. Tahir al-Qadri, okay, he's next. Running, he's running a whole program, website, so very strong. Allah uh, Musta'an, yes. The question is, um, since we're talking about something that we also sometimes get involved in, uh, because of not uh, knowing properly, when we are visiting Medina Manawa, mm. right, going to the masjid, um, first of all, the niya, why you are going there. Uh, secondly, it's a common practice uh, from you know from Jeddah, let's say. If I'm traveling and I'm telling my friends, I'm going to Medina, you'll say, say my salam as well. Uh, the third thing is, when we go Medina and then we go and visit, uh, and we you know, go to the grave, yeah. is there a specific salam that has to be said? Or the regular durood or salam is okay? Right. Concerning the first matter, uh, you know, when first, first, some of the scholars have even a reservation about the name Medina Munawwara. We were just discussing this earlier because this was not mentioned among the righteous predecessors. And Medina Nabawiya, as opposed to Munawwara, because we, we may go into the Sufi idea of the light of the Prophet ﷺ and, and whatever. But, anyways, that's besides the point. The niyyah for going to uh, the Masjid al Nabawi is to pray there and get the reward of a thousand salah for each salah. Period. Don't even include. The idea of the grave site. Don't even include it. Now if you happen to go there and you are at a remote area where you can actually go and give salam to the Prophet ﷺ, then you do so. And you know, Salamu alayka ya Rasulullah in this particular fashion as it is mentioned. Confirm. Right? And then Abu Bakr, then Umar. That's it. Uh, nothing beyond that. And don't, you know, waiting in line and making this, the whole people miss out on salah, on nawafil, on all kinds of good deeds and they're just trying to go and, you know, they think that this, this is something that is obligatory, it is not obligatory. Okay? So the idea, with that's where the shirk, you know, it, it, it kind of creeps in. And if somebody tells you, give the salam to the Prophet Wasallam, say why? Don't you know that if you give him the salam, Allah has assigned special angels who actually deliver the salam to him and he will reply to you, it will take longer with me. Right? And, and I, not only that, I will not be able to convey it. What, what am I going to tell him? Oh, by the way, Fulan gives you salam, so this is a conversation now. Now you're speaking to the dead. So, you know, nonsense. Nonsense, very common. Very common, you know, but not from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and this may lead to shirk. If you like to give him salam, wherever you are, it will be delivered to him bi-idhnillah, by Allah's will. Don't go to extremes in believing in that either. That's all we have from the sunnah, we stick to that. It doesn't mean you can speak to him. It doesn't mean that you can seek help from him. Allah had told us that, the Prophet ﷺ told us that salam is delivered to him. He, his soul is returned, so he can reply, and we stop right there. Clear? Zakallah khair. Mashallah, and then? People, they recommend that he did on behalf of the Prophet No, he did the on behalf of the Muslim Ummah, we don't do the biha on his behalf. See, every, every deed, which every Muslim, you know, does, until the Day of Judgment will be in the book of deeds of the Messenger of Allah. Ali he is the one who taught us that huda. He doesn't need that we sacrifice anything for him. That is not from the sunnah, I've read a fatwa from the ulama about the impermissibility of sacrificing an animal in the name, you know, or you know, as a hadiyah or as a gift to the Messenger of Allah. This is not allowed. Yeah, what? I don't know what the last three, two words mean. <laughs> Somebody translate the whole thing in English. Ya dafi' al-bala, a'udhu billah. A'udhu billah ya shaykh. 
You're basically saying that may Allah send His peace or may Allah exalt the mention and grant peace to, the, to you who prevents harm, who, who alleviates affliction. And this is who? Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah is the one who yakshifu al-dur, the one who will alleviate harm. Only Allah, not the Messenger of Allah. This is shirk. Not you, Habibi. You're my Muslim brother, inshallah. But whoever says that is saying a statement of shirk and calling on the Messenger of Allah besides Allah. And this is exactly what Islam came to destroy. It's the whole thing of Islam is that you don't go through anyone to get to Allah. You go direct. And people still want to put, put you know, intermediaries. And when they don't find anyone else, they put the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And Allah is innocent from that. No, this is not allowed, Habibi. And anything would sound similar. And in fact, my intention is to say this, As-salamu alayhi wa rahmatullahi wa rahmatullahi wa Only the Masjid of Nabi, from India, I can't say, like, during my prayers, I can't say As-salamu alayhi wa rahmatullahi wa rahmatullahi wa rahmatullahi wa rahmatullahi wa Can I still say As-salamu alayhi wa rahmatullahi Yes, you can. Yes, you can. But don't add anything. Yeah, yeah but it's not my intention. I'm going to go to the Masjid of Nabi and say this. No, that is one thing and that's another thing. These are two separate things. Giving him salam at the grave site, you know, when you happen to be at the Masjid al-Nabawi, it's not like the Durood Sharif which you say all the time. You can say Allahumma salli wa sallam, but usually you don't use the Ya al-Munad, al-Munadi, or al-Munada. You don't use the, what they call it, the, the, the calling. Because you, Ya Fulan. So you don't address him in this fashion, you know, like when you are sitting in such an environment. Now in the Salah, the scholars have differed, Assalamu uh, you know, in the Tashahud about the words which you use, but we will leave that aside for now. When you're sitting here, you say, Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. You say, Allahumma salli wa sallim. as salatu salam ala Rasulullah. Not ya, you don't call him directly. When you're there, you're standing near the grave, that's another situation. Considering Makkah and Madinah's blessed cities, and buying things from there will also be blessed. Never heard of that. I mean, it's, uh, it's Ard Mubaraka, no doubt. But, uh, you know, not saying that if you buy something from there, it is not necessarily blessed. Not necessarily. Because you may buy it from someone who, you know, didn't fear Allah. Your, the money may be haram. There may be other elements of, of issues. You know, I, I've never heard such a thing. Allahu A'lam. We'll just say Allahu A'lam. I look forward to seeing you all again. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.